Over a decade ago, I was traveling on vacation, and I had booked hotels through some page similar to Expedia, but smaller. Anyway, I got to one of the cities that I was visiting, and I walked to where the hotel I booked was supposed to be. It was a construction site. I tried to call the emergency number for the webpage, but no one ever answered. I was really mad, but I figured I would just deal with my refund once I was back home, and I looked for a new place to stay. I was in the city for an event, so I knew some other people who were also there. I asked them where they were staying and decided to just get a room there. It was like a Best Western or Holiday Inn, something along those lines. Anyway, I'm checking in and the receptionist tells me I already have a paid booking there in my name. I am 100% sure I did not mix up the addresses. Also, this hotel was a completely different brand or group. I suppose the website could have rebooked me but they never informed me of it. And the address that they sent me to was nowhere close to the other hotel. There are hundreds of hotels in that city. The chance that I would randomly pick that one were pretty slim. I never did manage to speak to anybody from that webpage, but it still freaks me out just a little bit. This story happens in the Latin American country I was living in at the time. I was a 22 to 23 year old female finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute and usually I had the afternoon shift. I left work every day at about 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, then walk like five minutes to get home from there. Even though this is and was one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings and I was ready to run and call for someone if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days, I had been seeing this very big, expensive white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days, I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously, this gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly at times, they said it could be a coincidence and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. This SUV started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing by me fast several times in a row, sometimes slow, almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone, as it was a popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went, and I noticed that they followed me to other parts of the city. This really freaked me out, and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They of course told me that they couldn't do anything about it unless it was physical, otherwise they could assume that it was just a coincidence. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about this situation. I alerted my parents, my boyfriend who was working in another city, friends and coworkers. I even told my boss and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work for the first week and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some fresh bread for lunch and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake just thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but I didn't want to alert them that I knew they were following me. For context, my street was very long 
And on one side, there were only buildings. On the other side, there was a tall wall. No houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was. But when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time, it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started to scream things at me. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me and that this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared also and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. A few minutes later, guess what? A chubby balding man in his 40s walked in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin entering her office. Since it had been a while since he had last seen her, me, he wanted to say hi, but she didn't hear him calling her. So he parked his car and went up to greet her. He insisted that he had seen this cousin walking inside the office, but my friend, bless her, insisted with a poker face that no one had ever entered her workplace since a few hours ago. She said later that she was shaking inside, but she wasn't gonna let them get the better of her. He asked if she was sure, and she kept telling the same story over and over and insisting that there was no one there and that she was all alone. She asked him to go. All the while, I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. When he finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. I was petrified with fear and terror, and so was she. We immediately called the police. This time, they took me more seriously. And as I had the license plate number, they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I couldn't even move. From that day on, I always had someone driving me in and out of work or school, or I took taxis, something that I hadn't done before because they're expensive. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had a talk with him. I never knew. I never want to know either. I shiver thinking about what his intentions with me were, but the fear comes back every time I think about him. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city. I just got home from work an hour ago. I have these dreams every night where this Japanese girl is always riding shotgun in my dream car, which is a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. The dreams have been getting a little too realistic for my taste. For example, she has a whole name, first, middle, and last. Either way, the dreams almost always consist of she and I just driving around and laughing at some dumb jokes. Well, tonight on my way home, I decided to glance over to the passenger side mirror and she's just sitting there. Same hair, same clothes. It was her. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't really unnerved by it in any way. That is, until she looked over to me and smiled. I smiled back and she was gone. Poof, she just vanished as if she was never there. Hell, the seatbelt was even undone. I'm honestly not sure how to feel about this. I'm guessing that in another reality or universe, I'm dating the girl of my dreams, and maybe there was some kind of overlap. I guess dreams could be realities. Maybe they're alternate realities. But could there be an actual meaning behind all of this? I still can't figure it out. What's even weirder is that I did some Googling about her name and I can't find anybody that exists with those names put together, first, middle, and last. I have no idea what's going on.
This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that someone had left the oven on. We each denied it, but we knew that someone had to have left it on because it was on. Looking back, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody even had food to put in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, and movements from out the corner of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting. However, myself and another were still not so convinced. It was soon only me that was left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing study, they looked up to see a face peering at them before vanishing. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by the year's end. And one of my friend's girlfriends swore she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches that you need to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night. And one room off the kitchen would send shivers down our spines any time we went in there. There was one night in particular which really scared me. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself it was just a dream, and went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open, and so were all the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night. So many other things happened in that house, but this has gone on long enough. I just decided to tell this story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate without saying which house I lived in, and he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate, which a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior. When I told him what number it was, and how I knew, he almost fell out of his chair. At least I know I'm not alone. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. We all got out of the house unscathed, but it really made believers out of all of us. About five years ago, I was in the Air Cadets, a UK organization affiliated with the RAF. My squadron was, and is, based in the Sergeant's Mess at IWM Duxford, a former RAF station, now a vast air museum. On this particular occasion, it was a summer evening and dusk was settling in. I was in charge of a camouflage exercise, which involved the cadets using camouflage to hide and me trying to spot them. I was walking past several World War II era buildings when I saw two figures in the distance walking toward me. As I got closer, I saw that the two figures were US Air Force officers, not an uncommon sight, were not far from RAF Lakenheath, a US Air Force base. Maybe they're visiting. As I got closer, I realized that they were wearing very outdated uniforms and had flying equipment that was extremely old. Still not thinking much of it, I saluted them as I walked past as is customary. They didn't acknowledge the salute, nor did they say anything. I walked off, feeling a little uneasy. Later that night, as the exercise wrapped up, I remembered the incident, and I asked my commanding officer who the two officers were. I got a very odd look. He said, Corporal, we haven't had any visitors tonight. 
Concerned that somebody may have broken in, security made a site-wide search, but could find nothing. They then quizzed me, and when I described the airmen I had seen, a grim look came over their faces. They proceeded to let me know that this wasn't the first time they'd been seen. Back in 1944, a B-17 flying fortress visited the airfield and took some personnel on a joyride. The aircraft collided with a navigation mast at low altitude and smashed into an accommodation building, exploding on impact and killing all aboard, plus one man in the barracks block. The building was located right next to where I had been walking. Furthermore, the men I described, they were the pilot and the navigator. They have been seen a few times over the years, often by security making patrols at night. I've always felt like I'm being watched when passing that spot. And sometimes I wonder if others feel the same way. This is a story about my little sister's experiences with the entity that haunted our Florida home. I myself have never experienced anything in that house, but I think you'll find her encounters very creepy. For my sister's privacy, I will refer to her as Liz. This all took place in Florida when I was 15 and Liz was 11. Liz shared a room with me and our youngest sister. She slept on the top bunk while I slept across the room in my own bed. I liked to entertain my sisters by telling scary stories or reciting the whole script to one of our favorite movies. Liz always had a habit of calling me out whenever I told a scary story. She didn't believe in ghosts, which makes this whole thing 10 times weirder. The first incident was probably around July, as I remember it was pretty hot. I had been asleep maybe three hours when I was shaken awake. It was Liz. She asked me why I was standing by her bed and staring at her. Having just been woken up, I was confused. I no longer sleepwalked, so I had no idea why she would think that I was staring at her all creepy-like. I got her back to bed and sat with her until she fell back asleep. The second incident was maybe four weeks later. While eating breakfast, Liz asked mom who the man in the hat was. Mom brushed her off, but I questioned her further. She told me that late last night, she woke up to find somebody standing next to her bed, peering at her through the safety bars. She described the figure as a man wearing a fedora type hat and wearing all black. He was very shadowy and disappeared when Liz blinked. The third and most terrifying incident happened a few days after. I remember waking up after a particularly terrifying nightmare. I looked over to my sister's bed and I noticed that Liz was sitting bolt upright, staring at me. I asked her what was wrong. She answered with fear apparent in her voice, the man in the hat was watching you sleep. That was the last and most terrifying incident I can remember. I don't believe he appeared again. We had our house blessed twice, so that may have deterred him. What do you think it was? I know we don't have any dead relatives that wore hats like that, so I'm very confused as to what she saw. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance, 
It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god-awful, low, guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child, with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story. But even now, when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. So at the time, I'm about eight years old and my mom got remarried and she was on her way to her honeymoon with my new stepdad. I went to my cousin's house out in the middle of the woods, near a really old coal mine with only a gravel road to get there. Just for perspective, the driveway is about 50 yards long and it's in direct sight of the front door. When I get there, nothing seems wrong. It's nighttime. I'm playing Wii with my cousin and he gets tired and falls asleep. We're sleeping in the living room, which has the front door in it and the door was mostly glass. So we're laying on the floor and I have direct vision through the front door. It's about midnight and I can't sleep. My mom is in a different country and I miss her being eight years old. So I just look out the door, laying there kind of zoning out. About 10 minutes later, I see something walking up the driveway. It looks like a shadow but it's white looking. It also looks like it has a pickaxe in its hand. I'm thinking, how can a shadow be white? It just doesn't make sense. And who would be outside right now with a pickaxe? At this point, I'm petrified because it stops about halfway. So about 25 yards from me and just starts hitting nothing with the pickaxe. Eventually, it stops swinging after 20 or so swings and walks back down the driveway, and I never saw it again. When I say it swings at nothing, I mean it. There was nothing there for it to hit, and it didn't make a sound. I just saw this person hitting the air with a pickaxe. After it walked down the driveway, I never saw it again. I'm 20 years old now, and I still think about this. Reliving it in my head makes me feel uneasy. It gives me chilling goosebumps, and it honestly makes my eyes water. I was too scared to say anything, and I only started telling people what I saw around the age of 15 or 16. That's when my cousin told me that he had seen the same thing before when he was little, and he never saw it again either. Most people have theorized to me that it was residual energy of a coal miner acting out his job. Perhaps where the house was used to be an extension of the mine or maybe there were rocks or ore that they chopped up, who knows. But either way, I get goosebumps every time I think about him. One night, a long time ago, in the mid 80s, I was riding around my hometown at about 10 p.m. with three other friends. 
Berkeley County, South Carolina was really country back in the day. So driving around at night on dirt roads is one of the things kids did to have some fun. The place we were driving to was called the Gravel Hill Light. It was down a long dirt road in the middle of the Francis Marion National Forest. There were no street lights of any kind and no houses for miles. Up until that point, I had seen the light a few times, and even to this day, nobody knows what it is. I know it's so bright that it's almost like a welder's torch, but about a hundred times bigger. There's no sound at all, and it disappears as soon as it appears. Anyway, this night we were on our way to see the light. We would usually park our car where the dirt road divides into another road, and after 10 or 15 minutes, the light would appear. We were driving and we hadn't even made it halfway yet to the place where the road divides, when we saw in the distance a red glowing light with fog and the outline of a body standing way down in the middle of the road. We had to drive slow, like 25 miles an hour because of all the potholes in the road. We were curious and we all said, what's that, at the same time. Then the glow turned off for about two seconds and came back on. This time, there were three to four figures standing in front of the red glow. And this time, they seemed to be about 50 feet closer to us than before. They were in contorted positions, but not moving at all. The light went off again and two seconds later, it came on. Again, they were much closer to us, and this time, there were about 10 figures silhouetted against this light, all standing in weird positions. I began screaming, turn the car around, now, I mean now. Everybody in the car quickly agreed to turn around and get out of there, which is exactly what we did. Back then, I always thought of the figure standing there as ghosts. But nowadays, I'm thinking more alien than ghosts. At 18 years old in the 80s, it just never occurred to me that it could have been alien. But now, it makes so much more sense. My friends and I really haven't talked about this since it happened. My family has been staying in Cripple Creek, Colorado on vacation. Prior to coming here, we had no idea that there was supposedly paranormal activity. So today my fiance and I decided to take a stroll through town, taking photos and whatnot. We heard this weird static noise that almost sounded like it was coming from a loud radio pretty far away. It would come almost in waves where you would hear it for a couple of seconds and then it would just stop. This continued until we reached the casinos. Fast forward to tonight, we're laying in bed, listening to a video. And I hear what sounds like a scratching noise on the window for the second night in a row. I paused the video and listened for a few minutes. After not hearing anything, I continued the video. About an hour and a half later, I was almost between a sleep and awake state, but I couldn't really fall asleep for whatever reason. Then all of a sudden, I hear a scratch again that instantly woke me up. I sat there and listened. I heard it again. I yelled, hey, loudly, and I ran outside with a flashlight, but I didn't see anything. No person, no signs of somebody trying to get through the screen, nothing. After this happened, I was pretty startled and I am by no means one that believes in the paranormal. But kind of jokingly, I said, what if it was a skinwalker? But later this led me to do some research on the town and apparently it is filled with all things paranormal. I've seen several things about the casinos, the jail, 
But has anyone else experienced anything at one of the homes here? I'm really curious. This happened almost 30 years ago, and I cannot forget about this person, if it was a person. I was spending the night at my boyfriend's mom's house, which I did almost every weekend while he was away at sea. Usually I slept on the couch in the family room, which was quite comfortable. Mrs. D always left a nightlight on in each room in case anybody needed to get up during the night. I awoke for some reason, and standing right before me was a fellow who looked like he was about to die of thirst. He was terribly sunburned, and his hair looked like it was sunbleached, almost like hay. He didn't say a word, but looked at me with such sorrow and hopelessness. He was dressed in worn clothes that I later found out were identical to some of the old 1860s photos of miners. This all happened in Santa Ana, California, just for some added context. His cotton shirt was collared and buttoned down, but very soiled. He had a cotton jacket of some sort as well. His boots were also of leather and very dirty and worn. His eyes were light and clear, but also very sad. His skin was creased and cracked looking. He didn't answer me when I asked if he was okay, so I said that I would go and wake Mrs. D. At this point, I genuinely didn't think he was a ghost. I thought he was alive and maybe an old friend of the family's. It would have been totally natural since this family had many friends and relatives that regularly came to visit. Anyway, I got up to go toward the hall where Mrs. D's bedroom door was, but when I turned to him as I passed, he was gone. There is absolutely no physical way that he could have gotten out of the house in that amount of time without me hearing it or noticing. He literally disappeared in front of my eyes. I never saw him after that, but to this day, I feel a deep sadness and compassion for the man who might have died trying to find some gold or silver after the gold rush was already over. The look of desperation on his face is one that I will never forget. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon, and require a 45-minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, Closed. Absolutely no access to hot springs. Fines $2,000 max, or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs, and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. 
Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek, and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle, June 20th, 1866. No way, a memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and oddly respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly, but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud, but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our site. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true, and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the Diamond Battle. And maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you too. It's been well over a year since I last saw a gnome. I have epilepsy, so I'm never sure if it's just my brain fabricating things, but I've never hallucinated due to seizures that I know of. That all being said, I once went to a psychic who did Akashic record readings. She told me that I was closely connected to earth spirits. I made no mention to her about seeing gnomes because, well, that makes you sound absolutely bonkers. 
For a short period of time, my ex and I lived at his late grandfather's house. The property was teeming with Japanese maples and native plants. He also kept an orchid room. One day, while taking a shower, I heard the bathroom door move and I saw a little drably dressed old man, about one and a half feet tall, run through the bathroom and climb out the open window. It scared the crap out of me. I let out a yelp. My ex came running in and so as not to be taken for even more medical testing than I'd already been through, when he asked me what happened, I just told him I'd slipped. Another thing I once saw may have been a troll, but I'm not sure. I have no idea what it was. Maybe one of you can enlighten me. I had been doing a lot of meditating, three hours or so, and I headed into my bedroom to change for the gym. I opened my closet, and there was this three and a half to four foot naked, wrinkly, elf type troll thing. I gasped and backed up, and it disappeared. Since both sightings mentioned here, I've had more than one CT scan, MRIs, etc. My seizures were a result of head trauma that happened well after what I'll refer to as the troll incident. There are other times that I have seen them as well. Once in childhood, I had an encounter with my late Noni and a few encounters with my grandfather who died when I was four. Again, my brain has been scanned a lot in multiple ways and nothing has ever been found other than some white spots from chronic migraines, and those popped up super recently. I've also been evaluated by a neuropsychologist, and nothing other than my seizures, due to the head trauma, has ever been wrong with me. Like I said, the head trauma happened way after I saw the troll or gnome or whatever it was. I don't know what these things are, but what do you think? A few years back, my mom was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousin's, and their kid's house. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We come from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mom, Although slightly skeptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, she suddenly saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three young people. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all as the shops are regular meeting places for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd about these young people. My mom said that they were dressed in the period of the 1970s, when my mom was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but nobody was acknowledging them. Their existence was completely overlooked by other people, as if they were invisible. My mom was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious teenagers had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop, as she thought maybe they had gone in. She waited until her bus came, 20 minutes later, but they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time that my mom wasn't watching them. Mom said the most unsettling thing about it was how normal these teenagers looked but the fact that she was the only one that seemed to be able to see them. It's a story she still tells today. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the Monument, as it was that before it was National Parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, 
which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned roadwork sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light, possibly. It was miles and miles ahead, but that's the thing about the dark, dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles, I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while. Maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little. We joked a lot. The norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved, and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely minds. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. 
even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. This happened a few years ago, but my husband and I still talk about it. If he hadn't been there, I would have written it off as some kind of dream. My husband and I were walking around on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. We decide to stop for a drink at the hotel and soak in the ocean view. We walk up to the hotel and we didn't notice much until we walked inside. When we walked into the hotel, the entire hotel was empty. Nobody was there. There was nobody behind the counters, not a single soul in the lobby, just empty. But it also had this weird buzz of energy, as though people had just been there. There were papers on the counters, cups on the tables. We walked inside through the restaurant outside by the pool no one. We walked back inside through the lobby. We probably spent about five to ten minutes there, and we never saw one person. We left because it was so creepy. Back on the street, everything was normal. People walking by, traffic, everything you would expect. I have no idea what caused no one to be there. It almost felt like the Truman Show where you go off the script and they don't have any actors ready. I would love any thoughts on what you think happened. Also, we were totally sober, and we thought perhaps it could have been evacuated, but there would have been people on the streets. I mean, it's a hotel. We asked around later, and nobody knew anything about anything that had happened that would warrant a hotel, so... To this day, we still don't know what happened. In Ivory Coast, West Africa, my friends and I walked into the biggest hotel and palace in the capital at 3 p.m. And it was completely empty and silent. There were no cars, no taxis outside, no customers, no employees. This hotel is an enormous complex with a mall, dozens of shopping stores, pools, tennis courts, restaurants, conference rooms, it's always busy, 24-7. I needed to withdraw money from the ATM, and all the doors were open, so I walked inside. It was the eeriest experience of my entire life. It was like the place had been abandoned. But why the open doors? And everything was okay. It was clean. Just all the people were missing. There were no lights on just the emergency lights. But since all the doors were open, the natural light was shining through. So at least it wasn't too dark. 
The only noise came from my steps on the marble, and there wasn't even an echo. My heart was pounding in my chest because the situation just didn't make any sense. At one point, I saw some light on in a store about 50 meters away from me, with people inside, and I breathed a sigh of relief. But once I arrived in front of the store, I noticed that I couldn't really distinguish the shapes or the faces of the people, even though it was clear glass. They were fuzzy, for lack of a better word. Panic started to kick in, but I still needed that money, so I hurried to the ATM that was closest. I was afraid the ATM would be dead, but surprisingly, it was functional. I withdrew the money and ran out of the hotel using the first exit I found. Still, no one in sight. After walking a few meters, I exited on another street and suddenly everything got noisy again. It was full of people and activity. I came back later to the hotel on another day and it was totally back to normal. It's been almost 20 years since this happened, but I will never forget this experience. I still think about it from time to time and every time I return and I walk past it, it still makes me feel weird. When I was in college, I was a banquet worker at a hotel. One night we were hosting a wedding and we ran out of trash bags. We couldn't find any anywhere. So my boss asked me if I could track down a room service cart and grab anything I could find, even if it was small. At this point, it's almost one in the morning. The wedding is winding down and the hotel is quiet. I didn't have access to the room service closets or laundry as a banquet server. So I was literally just going floor to floor, hoping that somebody had left their cart out. Finally, on the sixth floor, I saw a cart at the far end of the hall. I could hear a baby crying and I saw one of our hotel provided bassinets in the hall next to a closed room door. I had to pass the bassinet to get to the cart it was empty, as it should have been. As I got closer, the crying became louder. It made absolute sense to me, but it gave me this icky feeling in my stomach. I tried not to think anything about it. The baby must be in the room crying and the parents parked the bassinet outside because they decided not to use it, right? I raided the cart for the roll of bags and I noticed that the cart belonged to my friend Juana. She had an Aerosmith sticker on her cart, so I knew that it was hers. The next day I saw her at work and I mentioned that I had stolen her bags and apologized because she probably had to hunt some down at the very beginning of her shift. I then jokingly thanked her for leaving it next to the bassinet or baby room and I joked about how unsettling it felt to be in an empty hotel corridor next to an empty bassinet while listening to a crying baby in the wee hours of the morning. She was like, that's weird. I cleaned a room on that floor at the very beginning of my shift. I took the bassinet back down to the rollaway storage room first thing yesterday morning. That family checked out before you even got here. We discussed how unusual it was to have more than one family with a baby request a bassinet so close together, especially on the same floor. We rarely had to dig out a bassinet. At that point, we kind of thought that maybe it was two different families with two different babies who got a bassinet, but it was still strange. As I was leaving and clocking out in the laundry room, Juana stopped me to tell me that the bassinet shouldn't have been there. She double checked the logs. No other families had requested one or even been there. We have a checkout sheet for bassinets and rollaway beds so that if we need one, 
and we can't find one, we know where they were the last time they were used. Sure enough, Juana's room was the last one to have a bassinet. The sheet showed another coworker checking it out for the family when they arrived, and Juana checking it back into the rollaway room over 12 hours before I saw it in the hallway. I guess technically she could have forged her check-in signature, but why would she have done that? There would have been no point. And she clearly recalled returning it to the closet. Regardless of whether or not that bassinet should have been there, the crying baby definitely shouldn't have because there was no child, no family, checked into that room or even on that floor. The family had checked out early and had been long gone before I went hunting for a cart. In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot or using the metro. It wasn't that much of a bother, until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs, and it's overall a great place to party. But from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there, so I was the only one without a means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20-minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 35-minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Ava, decided to walk back with me and just take her bike next to her so that she wouldn't leave me alone wandering around the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we left. As we're walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie and I was rather hungry, so that was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having some kind of food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took up almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I remember telling myself I had to tell Ava about it when the flow of conversation allowed it. As I was walking and starting to cross the road, the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got kind of blank. It's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past this restaurant, Ava stopped, turned to me and said, wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I had completely forgotten to tell her. It's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was, a hotel. The large windows were the same, and inside was the hotel's restaurant, with a layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw, and nobody was sitting there eating. We were both very shocked, and saw that a male receptionist with short hair was in there. I knew we just had to ask him if somebody had just been eating there. It was just too weird. He was a little bit freaked out about us coming in like that, but he said he'd been alone in there for hours. After discussing with Ava, we found out that she also saw the woman eating, but she only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window. While I could tell everything about this woman, because I saw her entire profile. After that, Ava never wanted to talk about it again. She got mad whenever I tried to bring it up. People seemed to have changed around me after this event too. Even my mom started to not remember things that she should have remembered. And a lot of people just seemed different overall. 
I must also note that I was not drunk, not by a long shot, and staying up that late was really common for me at the time, so I didn't feel sleep deprived either. Also, Ava saw the same thing I did. Interestingly enough, the name of the hotel that was originally a restaurant when we saw it is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tale stories. All in all, a very weird experience. A friend and I booked a hotel room to ring in the new year. At the time of this event, I was completely sober. We were in the room and I called the front desk to ask about room service. They told me that there would be a rather loud party in the room below us this evening and offered to move us to another room. We accept this offer. They told us to get our keys ready so that we could swap them with the staff person who would deliver our new keys to our room in a few minutes. I start packing what little I had already unpacked and my friend hands me her key in the little paper holder. I pulled out my change purse and removed my key to put it in the holder with hers. This is when things got a little wonky. I can't exactly remember if I put the keys in my pocket of my sweatshirt or if I placed them down in front of the TV. But either way, when I came back from grabbing my travel bathroom bag in the bathroom, the keys were gone. I couldn't find them anywhere. The staff person arrived just a second after this. I go to answer the door to tell them that I seem to have misplaced our current keys and to please give me a minute. But I never do. I search through everything in the two relatively small organized bags that I had. I searched all the pockets of my jacket, the floor, the bathroom underneath the pillows. They were nowhere. I never left the room. These keys just vanished. From the time that I left the main room to go grab my bag and the time I came back, just a few seconds, those keys were gone. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened to those keys. We never did find them. My family never really had money. My mom was a cleaning lady for the majority of my life and occasionally cut hair on the side in our basement. My dad was the get-rich-quick type who never wanted someone like a boss to answer to, and his ego, unfortunately, got in the way of making a living. At times, he did make some big money, but it was always in lump sums, which he spent as quickly as he got. In 1998, he invented and patented this newly engineered golf club and partnered with a few investors, and money was coming in frequently. He was even doing interviews on the local news about it. It caught some major buzz locally, and then nationally within a couple of years. Finally, he was bringing an income into the household. We always rented. I lived in three houses I know of by the time I was eight years old. Around my 10th birthday in 2001, my mom and dad told us they were looking for houses in a nicer area to buy. About a week later, my mom brought my brother, two sisters and I to see a house not far from the house that my parents rented. We pulled up and it was huge. Well, huge for us. We walked into the front room and it was wallpapered with, well, the only thing I could use for reference would be Snozberry's wallpaper from the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory movie. The carpet was mint green and had two white French doors going into the dining room. The previous owner's son, who was a middle-aged graying man, didn't exactly greet us with a smile. He almost looked frustrated, like we were late, but we weren't. My siblings and I looked at each other as if my mom was crazy for wanting this weird ass house. Then we saw it. He showed us into the kitchen. 
The kitchen was huge, with high ceilings. It was half of the first floor, and all knotty pine. The walls, the cupboards, the walk-in pantry, shelves that rounded the entire kitchen. That was the selling point. It was beautiful, and something you don't see much of in humble old colonial homes. Two small bedrooms upstairs with barely a hallway, both knotty pine as well. A little overkill, and also creepy for a bedroom that isn't in a cottage, but hey. My parents opted to make the whole semi-finished basement into their master bedroom. My mom was dead set on buying it, and persuaded my dad. We still talk about how all of us felt this pull into this house. We moved in a couple of months later at the end of summer. My job that afternoon was to attempt to put mine and my brother's bed frames together with the headboard. I didn't know what I was doing, so I started stacking all the nuts and bolts to see how high I could get them before my dad finally came in to do it for me. My mom promised my sisters, who were directly across the hall from me and my brothers, that if they got the smaller room, they could paint it. So my brother and I got the bigger room, with one built-in dresser and a little small door that went into a huge attic, which was another room in itself. I haven't dared to go into the attic, or even wanted to open the door, though. The door looked like it was meant for children, though. Almost like an entrance to a treehouse, or a door for a Keebler elf's hut, like on those cookies. I didn't like that, and I definitely didn't like that I had to sleep next to it. As I'm sitting there, stacking nuts and bolts, I hear a woman clearly say, No. I look into my sister's room thinking that it's one of them, or my mom, but it wasn't. I would have heard somebody coming up the stairs and hit the hallway. So I turn around in my sister's doorway, and I feel the air get thick, like I could almost feel the body heat from someone standing too close. I can only explain the feeling as almost like that feeling when you can't focus because someone keeps fidgeting and moving around. I ran down the stairs and out the back door where my mom was smoking a cigarette, talking to our new neighbors. To them, I just looked like some kid running around the new house, but I was terrified. Fast forward to winter and we're all settled in. My godparents came over to give me a gift a couple of weeks before Christmas. I opened it and it was a lime green comforter that had football helmets of every NFL team cool if I ever cared about football at all. It was big and warm, so it quickly became my favorite thing in the world. They left late, and we were told since it's Saturday we can watch TV in our rooms until whenever. So I brought my new comforter to bed and turned on a nick at night, quickly falling asleep. I wake up, and the TV is still on. Mind you, mine and my brother's twin beds are right next to each other and both are against a wall with a gap in the middle to get out. I look over at my brother, and his back was to me. Then I go to look at the TV, which is directly in front of us on the built-in dresser, and I adjust my eyes. I see a woman sitting on the edge of my brother's bed, dark long hair, what looks like a dark purple cardigan, and a dark floral skirt. The only light source was from the TV, and it was illuminating her features. I couldn't put into words or reference how she looked until recently when I watched the movie The Knowing, which is a horrible Nicolas Cage movie. But in the movie, you couldn't quite see all of the alien's face, just a silhouette of the light and darkness. That's the best way I could describe it. I see a ring that appears to be catching light on her finger. I have no clue if it was on her finger or if she was holding it. She just sat there on the edge of my brother's bed, head down, and admiring this ring that was catching the light off of my television screen. She didn't seem to notice me. I tried to sink into my mattress and slip my head under my new comforter, and I just laid there, in shock. I waited until I heard my mom start the coffee pot to run to the kitchen and tell her what had happened. I even drew her a picture. She believed me. My dad, not so much. Almost the exact same experience happened again two years later with my sister, 
when we switched rooms, because two teenage girls obviously need a bigger space. There was nothing paranormal that we noticed happening in between those experiences. It happened and we would never bring it up. My dad's new and improved golf club had one little problem. There was a defect. The head was flying off left and right on numerous orders. My dad was back to being broke. You'd think a mortgage, a wife, and four kids would give him a little pep in his step to get a steady job, at least in the interim, but nope. Back to the drawing boards and back to us kids helping clean banks with my mom on the weekends for extra money. The fighting started, the divorce happened, Dad moved out and mom stayed in the house with us. By this time, I'm 14, my first year of high school and finally I could go out with my friends, even the ones who had cars. My mom started drinking heavily on the weekends around this time and would frequently call whatever friend I was with that had a cell phone and spout out her Taco Bell order because she knew we would end up there at some point before I came home. My sisters worked doubles together at an Italian restaurant every weekend, so my mom would always be home by herself having a pity party and getting drunk. My mom calls my friend and I tell her not to answer. I told her that I would just get the regular Supreme Burrito with no beans that she always orders. I get home and she's in the living room and she starts telling me about a man she was talking to. He looked like a young Elvis, she said, and he sat in the chair across from where she laid on the love seat. She was drunk. I didn't pay it any attention. She was just rambling about a dream, I was sure. The next day, the friend who my mom had called came over and told me that she wanted to play the voicemail that my mom had left her when she called the day before. My mom had said, hey, I just wanted to see what you guys were up to and if you go to Taco Bell, could you get me the regular thing I ask for? Then the phone stays connected. She never hangs up. At first you hear nothing, then a conversation between her and a man. At points, she interrupts him wondering who he is. You can't really tell what he's saying, only bits and pieces, but my mom's voice is clear. Then he told her at the end, as clear as day, please lay on your side just in case you get ill. I got instant chills. My friend was visibly disturbed, even after already hearing it, and I felt sick. We played it for everyone, and they all had the same reaction. My mom remembers none of it. She doesn't remember telling me about the man, and she doesn't remember the incident. We forgot about it, and we never talked about it anymore. My dad got sick of living with his own mother, and the house was in his name, so he legally kicked my mom out. And at this point, my older sister moved in with her fiancé, and my other sister moved with mom, to a house that they rented a few minutes away. My brother and I stayed behind because my mom got a job as a caregiver for that winter in Florida. As soon as my dad moved back in, things took a turn. He did not believe in ghosts. He was a huge skeptic. Until around 2007. He sat up in bed late at night and was smoking a cigarette. He had a big solid oak sleigh bed and it had a huge headboard. He started hearing knocks and felt the vibration on the headboard because his back was resting on it as he sat up. He stood up and it stopped. He sat down and relaxed his back, back up against the headboard. Something started knocking, then pounding hard on the headboard. He stood up and came to the basement stairs and called us down there so that we could witness this, trying to make us believe in something that we already knew was there. A couple of days later, Christmas lights flew across the room like somebody had yanked them. A couple of days after that, loud sounds of what sounded like scraping metal across concrete came from the attic. A week later, my brother's sleeping and gets punched in the face. A couple of days after that, my dad's girlfriend sees a hand appear over him in bed. That upcoming weekend, the kitchen chair moved into the hallway while we were all in the living room watching movies. Coffee teaspoons and hairbrushes would disappear and reappear. Sounds of people going up the stairs. Friends who knew nothing about any of this would see what looked like someone walking back and forth from the upstairs bedroom. It got bad. We were all terrified. My dad was screaming into the void. 
He couldn't protect us or beat the ass of whoever was doing all of this. By this time, my dad was working, probably just to get out of the house, which meant he had to take plenty of business trips. While coming home from Virginia, Bate had it that at the airport, he met Jason Hawes and Grant Wilson from the sci-fi show Ghost Hunters. They were coming to investigate a haunted prison for the show. My dad just started watching their show because of all the things happening in our house and only went over to them with the sole intention of getting help for what we were going through. They set him up with contacts to a paranormal group that they knew well for our area. They came, they saw, and they told us that it was definitely paranormal activity. The psychic said that there was a man who liked to hang out in the basement and the living room. A greaser type, with slicked back hair and cigarettes rolled in his sleeve, kind of like a young Elvis. Also, he loved my dad's new car. A woman who was reserved and quiet who liked the attic and the naughty pine bedroom was there too. An impatient and angry old woman who paces around everywhere and likes the living room was also there. The team set up cameras, tripods, and microphones around the whole house before shutting off the lights. The only things eventful that happened the night of was a camera and a tripod were thrown to the ground in the attic and everyone heard that metal against concrete scraping sound. It was so loud it sounded like it was in the middle of the room. They left and when they came back a few days later, they had evidence. A woman's voice was caught saying no before the camera and tripod flew forward in the attic. The investigators, while bending down to go through the attic door to set up the tripod, said that one of the cameras in the naughty pine room caught a woman saying, crawl out, you have to crawl out. There were growls. There were snarky remarks said in the basement and a man's voice saying, where is she? The investigators did the whole spiel. You're dead, it's time to go to the other side. It was a lot to take in. My dad, who was raised Catholic, asked if they could set up a home blessing, which we got that afternoon and we all had to take part in. It did definitely settle down after that. There are a lot more things that went on in that house, but I'm writing a novel over here. This house somehow sticks with all of us and my family. My friends still talk about the house. I dream about it all the time. It sounds funny, but there's a definite trauma that lingers when you spend your adolescent years living in a place like that. I think it's so strange, like it still has a hold on all of us. Everyone's pins, passwords, and top secret codes are the numbers of that address, still, and we haven't lived there since 2010. The weird pull that we all have to this house, telling each other when we happen to drive by it, the way we weirdly miss it, it's just strange. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence and difficulty holding his bowels. They really did a great job and deserved my compliments several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed sometime in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services, and so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission as it just didn't feel right charging it. These two individuals had done so much to make his last years comfortable I just couldn't take that money. About a week later, we held the service, which I officiated. It was well attended and we gave Felix the send off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for the family by the funeral home and cemetery after the service. And we all sat around for a while, just decompressing and taking a well needed break. The wife, Mary, 
then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. This was during the time where we had physical landlines and attached answering machines. She pressed the play button and the timestamp that the machine read was the identical time as when we had started the graveside service. It was recorded at 11 a.m. sharp. We thought at first it was just somebody who had missed the service calling to wish condolences. When the recording started though, every jaw in the room dropped and an oddness to goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present, Mike, Mary, the daughter, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street whose name I don't know. The background noise was the first thing we heard. It sounded like somebody was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing we could discern. Then, Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. He said, please do not follow me. Then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling us during his own funeral service, begging us to please not follow him. The rest of the group talked about what he could have meant. Don't follow him to death, not possible, they said. Don't follow his life choices. He had made many bad ones during his life. The daughter absolutely believes that he was saying, don't follow me into hell. She believed until her dying day that her father had made contact one last time, telling her to not follow his path and end up where he did once he took that step into the unknown. I always thought that was so strange. 20 years later, and I remember that moment and the stunned silence, shock, and fear, just like it happened yesterday. Nobody was comforted. It honestly felt chilling. I still don't know what he meant, but I am 100% certain that the phone call was definitely from Felix, and it definitely came from the other side. Redditor Throwaway1964 is a firefighter. What they encounter during one particular call has never left them. This is their story. I'm a firefighter and medic. I went to a house fire with one entrapped on the second floor once. Sounded like a lady screaming. We went up there and couldn't find her anywhere. Visibility in a fire is pretty awful, so finding people inside can be difficult. We spent about 20 minutes looking before a command ordered us to abandon the search. It was pretty disheartening because we knew somebody was there and we knew that we were basically leaving them to die. When we got out, we wanted to know why we were ordered to stop the search. And we were told it was because there was never anybody there in the first place everybody was accounted for. I argued that the information they had must have been incorrect because I heard a lady screaming up there. By this point, the fire had been knocked down and we went back to ventilate and look for a body, but we never found one. We overhauled for two hours, but there was no trace of anyone else in the building and everyone was still accounted for. I still have no idea what happened. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager, and only on a brief trip. 
When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no, I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like, how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late thirties, maybe early forties, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us as if they knew us too. Ah, oh, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us, but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed up to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye. Uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea, I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us, but I mean, what are the odds of that? And that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us.
Last week, my mother stayed at her friend's house in Florida on vacation. Her friend was out of town during that time, so it was just my mom alone in the house. Her friend is a little eccentric and artsy, but I'm not really sure if she is interested in anything paranormal. She does always insist that she doesn't believe in anything, that she's not religious or spiritual at all. My mom told me that when she first got to the house, she felt a little creeped out. Her friend is a super neat freak, so my mom believed that she probably had cameras around the house. My mom felt like she was being watched, and there were all these creepy statues and masks everywhere. There were also little artistic looking altars of bone and beads, but her friend is an artist also, so it kind of made sense. The first day in the house, my mom texted me a picture of one of the statues as a joke, saying, this guy guards the kitchen. He really stops the midnight snacking. I responded and we texted back and forth a little before we stopped. The weird thing is, about an hour after we stopped texting, she sent me the photo again with the same text. I ignored it, but then a couple of hours later, she sent it again. This continued at random for the entire length of the night until about 2 p.m. the next day. Finally, I texted her back and I said, cut it out, mom, this is getting creepy. She told me she only ever sent me the photo once. We even compared our messages after she got back into town. However, the really creepy part was when my mom was in the kitchen. She started to get really freaked out and couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. So she turned on her spirit box. That might be the wrong word for it, I'm not sure, but it's a thing that flips through radio channels really fast and ghosts are supposed to be able to stop it on certain words. She stood there for a long time, not saying anything and just listening. When her spirit box said, decompose, my mom asked if someone was there and the spirit box said, Cooper. My mom didn't want to encourage it any further, so she didn't ask any more questions. But then, completely at random, the spirit box said, all alone. My mom turned off the spirit box because she didn't want to hear anymore and she left the house. She told me at night she would hear footsteps upstairs, even though she was alone in the house, as well as voices and music. But sometimes she wasn't sure if the voices and music were the neighbors or not. She was so scared that she planned an escape route through the back door if she ever heard the footsteps coming down the stairs, but thankfully that never happened. One of the statues stares out at the garden through the sliding glass door. She said she always felt like that one was watching her, even though it was actually turned away from the interior room. The other weird thing about the house is even though her friend said she wasn't religious, she had something called, I think my mom said, Mitsutsas on every single door inside the house. It's something from the Jewish religion. She's not Jewish and even if she was, I think you're only supposed to put them on your front and back door. It's something for protection. I don't quite have all the details, but it was almost like her friend was trying to get protection at every single door. The friend is aggressively hospitable and she's been asking my mom to stay over at her house for a while. Like she'll be upset if my mom visits and gets a hotel. We have theorized that if there is a ghost in the house, maybe it truly is all alone and somehow influences her to desperately want people to stay there. Or maybe it was saying that it knew my mom was there all alone. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy, while I was popular and in all honors and college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed, until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and teased that it would never happen. 
so that's why I mention this. In 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend to or understand the hiding of medications, thus leaving large amounts of all kinds of drugs just lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas in 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman that he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that it's Josh playing practical jokes, something he was well known for. But this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase, separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn, with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of the yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter, and praying that her father would navigate my loss, and that he would keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told him he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing by my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, which was tiny, and that was it, other than the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex spray paint that we were using. I told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him or whatever, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. I'm not a believer in the paranormal, and to be honest, I'm still very skeptical, but I'll share my experience anyway because maybe it could provide some answers. I visited the Castle Museum in York, England. I specifically went there for a birthday trip. 
and me being somebody who's obsessed with history, it was a no-brainer going there. The museum was fantastic, and I had a great time going through all the different floors and rooms it contained. About an hour in, we came across the prison section of the museum. Now this wasn't a huge prison, more like a dungeon than anything else. There were maybe about four cells on either side, all open for the public to wander inside and look around. Each cell was brightly lit enough to see where you were going, except for one. On the very far left side was a cell that had no lights, no furniture, no bed or tables or windows, nothing. It was pitch black and empty. So I decided that as a challenge, I would go inside and stay there for about 10 seconds. About five seconds in, I felt somebody go right up to my ear and whisper something. Unfortunately, I never made out what it said because I instantly panicked and ran out of the cell. Now my first thought afterward was maybe there was a speaker hidden inside the room, playing sounds to scare people. But unless the speaker was really just right next to my ear, I don't see how that was possible. My second thought was maybe a mischievous staff member or tourist decided to hide and scare us. But again, I would have had to have felt somebody leaning against me for how close it was in there. Sadly, I didn't ask a receptionist or anyone who worked there about that cell, or if there were any other reported experiences. I really wish I had. But I did do some research, and I found many stories and even some photographic evidence of paranormal encounters inside that prison section. So, either the darkness got to my head and I imagined it, or I am in fact another person to make contact with one of the restless souls who still wanders the museum. This happened to me a few months ago. My two friends and I decided to take a trip to Los Angeles for fun. Keep in mind that we're from the East Coast, and we don't know anybody in LA. On the last day of our vacation, we had to check out of the hotel by 11 a.m. The night before, we had gotten back to the hotel really late, so we ended up sleeping in. We knew that it would be difficult to get completely packed up and ready to leave by 11, so we decided to go to the front desk and request a late checkout of noon. We had done this at another hotel before with no issues, and this place wasn't really at capacity with guests, so we figured it was a reasonable request. I drew the short straw and was tasked with going down to the front desk. The elevator in this hotel was really old and quite small, and I found it to be very creepy. I also have mild claustrophobia, so I avoided the elevator and walk down the three flights of stairs instead. I asked the receptionist if we could have a late checkout and gave her the room number. She looked at me surprised and said, yes, we approved your late checkout already, a few minutes ago. I was very confused and I asked her to elaborate. Apparently a girl had come down a minute or two before me to ask for a late checkout for our room number and then had walked out of the building. At this point, I figured that maybe one of my friends had, for whatever reason, decided to take the elevator down and ask before I did. I grumbled a bit at this because I had just walked down those stairs for no reason at all, and it didn't make any sense why they would ask me to go and then beat me to it. But I got back to the room, and to my surprise, both of my friends were there. One of them was taking a shower, and the other one was packing. It didn't look like either of them had left the room. So, I was kind of like, alright, which one of you's the prankster? They were pretty confused and asked me to explain. So I told them what the receptionist had said, and they were shocked. Neither of them had left the room, and it seemed too big of a coincidence that somebody would have the same request as us at the same time 
and just make the mistake of giving our room number. I have no idea who that girl was that made the request. They started joking that maybe it was me from another dimension or something. But yeah, whatever it was, the whole thing was kind of eerie. During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a Black Track Ghost, which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy mining office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride, until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner, walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But if she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the Black Track Ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the Black Track Ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed. It just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm. The haunting stopped sometime around the mid-50s, though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since. 
and nobody really knows why. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon, and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general, but toward the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp, and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in, because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him. When all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge, on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen, watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight, and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge, and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out. And after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. 
She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place and once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong, not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time, like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, Oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing, but Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail, because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good, dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. 
Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up, not when she didn't notice us sitting there, not when she looked in the window, not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened and I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels, but this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were or why it was here of all places or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened and I don't have any answers. I received a call from my brother with no caller ID or phone company record very soon after he died. It sounded like long distance calls used to sound back when we all had landlines, as if he was very distant. At first I was perplexed, but once I said his name, things cleared up a bit and soon after the call ended. I think his energy was just still strong enough that he had the ability to pop in to let me know he was okay. He's visited many times in other ways. The most concrete was a lucid dream in which he revealed that he was not relieved that his long battle with cancer was over. I have a good vocabulary, but he used terminology that I just would not have. It wouldn't have even been in my mind. So I know it wasn't my own mind trying to work through his death. He was more tethered in the time soon after his death. Now he just pays visits now and then, especially when I'm sick. I know it because sometimes I feel his hand on my forehead, something he always liked me to do for him when he was ill. My kids and I have had a lot of experiences, not just with him, but I'll always remember that phone call right after he died. Here's a bit of background. I'm from Texas and my boyfriend is from Maine. We both live in Texas now in a decently sized city outside of Dallas. But during the summer, we attempt to escape the heat and visit his family in Maine for a few weeks. I've had my fair share of experiences growing up in a haunted house. So I was raised as a believer. Weird things seem to happen frequently but I don't like to automatically attribute it to a ghost or whatever. I like to think that I'm a fairly logical person 
and I like to try to debunk weird things. That being said, my boyfriend is pretty skeptical and doesn't spook easily, so that makes this story even more interesting. Around 11 p.m. one night, he and I were sitting on his dad's front porch and we were just chit-chatting. The porch is raised and looks down over a backyard that runs to the tree line at the edge of thick woods. We were just hanging out, completely sober, I might add, when we heard what sounded like an adolescent boy singing scales. It was just your typical la 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 la. It was just background noise, and honestly, we were used to living in an apartment so much in the city that we didn't really think anything of it. In fact, we were annoyed. My boyfriend actually said, do you think he knows we're here? That could be awkward. I laughed, and then I realized what we were listening to. We were hearing what sounded like a boy in the woods late at night, walking back and forth in the dark woods, singing scales over and over. My boyfriend was still bent on the idea that he should give the guy some warning that he had an audience. So he sang a tune of scales back to him. La 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 la. The same scale came loudly right from the trees. It sounded like whoever it was was instantly standing right at the tree line beside us. It was loud and it seemed that whoever or whatever it was had instantly covered a huge amount of distance to go from somewhere off in the woods to just a few feet away from us. We both instantly had that fight or flight response and without thinking or talking about it, we both jumped up as if we were going to run into the house. Something felt weird. We had flipped a switch from harmless, awkward fun to terrified. There's a house back there, right? I asked my boyfriend. There has to be, he said back. We were spooked and we went into the house anyway. We both couldn't stop thinking about it and suddenly the details began to sink in about just how weird this actually was. First, if that was an actual person, we would have heard them stomping around in the woods. The song sounded as if they were pacing back and forth over an area of about 20 feet, and the woods were thick. You couldn't walk through them without cracking leaves and twigs. Second, there were no lights through the trees. If that actually was a 12 or 13 year old boy, unless he has night vision or something, he would have needed a flashlight to accompany him, especially if he was taking careful steps so as not to make a sound. If there was a flashlight, we would have seen it through the darkness. Third, how did he instantly cover that much space to get right beside us at the tree line? I know that voices can be carried on the wind, but there was no wind that night. It also sounded enough like a real person not a floating voice on the wind, that we both automatically assumed there was an actual boy out there. Lastly, we asked his dad where in the woods his neighbor's house was. He just looked at us and said, I don't have neighbors. There's no house back there for miles. People in Maine don't tend to have close neighbors, but the next day we went back and checked anywhere and there was no sign of people anywhere. I've lived in the same house for a decade now. The old lady who used to live here died, and her best friend still lives next door. I'm not sure how long she has left. But this house has always been spooky. It's always cold. It's really old. And I have had a lot of weird experiences for years. It's very common for me to hear footsteps, doors opening and closing, and my cat staring at random corners. My front door once opened and slammed closed by itself, and my mother saw an apparition of a Victorian lady in the front hallway in the middle of the night. I was also once home alone showering downstairs. 
and I heard somebody aggressively pacing back and forth in my room, opening and slamming my drawers closed. After a while, you get used to it, and you just accept the flow of things. For a while, the activity died down, and things seemed less scary. Plus, I moved away for university, so I got a huge break from the spooky stuff. But now I'm back, and the activity has spiked. A few nights ago, I was having a particularly hard mental health day. I was up at about 4 a.m., facing the wall, trying to sleep with my back to the door. My radio is always on at a low volume, and the music was playing. But I suddenly hear the voice of a woman behind me, almost groaning. It sounded like she was letting all the air out of her lungs, almost like wheezing. I freaked out, and when I looked, there was no one there. Yesterday, I was FaceTiming my boyfriend, and I heard footsteps in my house again, which I haven't heard in months. Distinct paces up the stairs, shuffling on the floorboards. I was genuinely scared, and even thought it was an actual intruder, but nobody was there. I'm scared that perhaps I'm manifesting something. I've never heard a woman before in this house, and the wheezing was so clear. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I'm scared of losing my sanity. And maybe I am. But my house has always been spooky, and this sudden spike has no real explanation. I'm going to try to smudge the house with some herbs that I gathered to feel a little bit safer. Hopefully, it works. I'm currently visiting York, Maine for a family reunion. We're renting a house about a mile from the Nubble Lighthouse, if anyone cares to look up the location. This house has a wraparound porch with a front door and a side door right before the porch ends and the stairs lead to the backyard. The side door has a very recognizable sound. It almost sounds like somebody passing gas. We joked about it the first night there. The front door creaks like any other old door and slams on the frame. You can hear the wood, then the rubber liner on the door squeeze shut against the frame. Anyway, the first night we got settled in, we all went up to bed around midnight. It's a three bedroom house with very thin walls. You can hear conversations happening in the kitchen from the upstairs bedrooms, and every floorboard creaks with any movement. My mom and dad went up to bed first, followed by my brother, my girlfriend and I followed about 15 minutes later. The other night, I'm upstairs in my room waiting for my girlfriend to get out of the bathroom. I hear a creak and a slam from downstairs, and the vibration through the house of a door hitting the frame. At first I thought it was my dad coming in from a smoke, but I listened and I could hear him snoring in his bedroom. Once my girlfriend got back, I asked her if she dropped anything. She said that she hadn't, but she thought I had fallen off the bed or something because the noise was so loud and shook the house. Kind of creepy, but I didn't think much of it again until last night. Around 12.30 to 1 in the morning, the same door creak and slam noise occurred at roughly the same time. And after this second time, keeping me wide awake, I decided to ask the rest of my family if they were up and about in the middle of the night. My parents deny walking around downstairs, and my brother then tells me he's been sleeping with his light on every night since the very first, because he would hear soft footsteps and feel a presence standing at the back of his room. We're going to have a quieter evening tonight and keep an ear to the downstairs area before bed to see if we hear anything else. I'm also considering laying in my brother's room in the dark to see if I hear or feel anything out of the ordinary. 
If anybody has any experience with this and may know how to stimulate more action, please let me know. I love paranormal things, but up to this point in my life, this is the closest I've ever been to experiencing any. I wish I had more to the story, but this is what we've been going through so far. It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the Panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day a stoplight only a block away from us. A very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere. But that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal, and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, 
but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, but, and she said quietly, there's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast, I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom and she said under her breath, I told you not to look. And gave me this look that said, don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. This is the true story of my childhood through adult years as I recount it. Rattlesnake Road is an original name to a road that has since been changed. I used it to maintain anonymity. I was born on Long Island, New York, and ever since I can remember, I've had really strange experiences. I was never able to sleep at night, and from a young age, I was always terrified of the dark. Yes, every child is afraid of the dark, but I was afraid for a reason that I was unable to explain until later in life. There are a few stories from while I was there, but I want to fast forward to when I was a little bit older and things began to make sense to me. My family purchased a second home and we moved to Colorado. We lived on a ranch located at the top of a hill that fed into the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't much around us, a few neighbors, our barn with our animals, and thousands of acres of hilly and mountainous terrain that surrounded our family. There was a long dirt road that led to our property, Rattlesnake Road. It was a perfect shot of the scenery leading up to our small three-bedroom home. It was quiet, peaceful, but the land was old. I was about seven years old at the time. This is when I began to understand what I was going through wasn't normal. Our home was small. It was a ranch style house with a three car garage, which took up half of the structure. The other half was built into the hillside where you entered from the front. You walked into the living room and you could see straight out the back sliding doors into the plains. In front of you was the kitchen, old with brick. Straight down the hallway, my room was on the right, my brother's room followed that, and lastly, my parents' room was on the left. The bathrooms connected and were on the right as well, wrapping around to the back of the house. I left the hallway lights on when I slept. I was scared to begin with, but something always felt as though it wasn't just our family there. One night, I was up and I couldn't fall back asleep. My parents and brother were sleeping as well. I could hear them snoring down the hall. My bedroom door was open and I was facing the hallway when suddenly the pull string to my closet made a click and the lights popped on. I could see the light making its way through the slatted shades of my closet accordion doors and my heart began to race. Then they shut off. The air in the room became cold, tense, almost as though the oxygen was being siphoned out. The silence set in. I couldn't hear the snoring anymore. I couldn't hear anything. I looked toward the hallway, and there was a short, black static mist. It had no facial features, but 
what I could see would have been a mouth. It seemed as though it was smiling ear to ear, which paralyzed me with an intense feeling of dread. It passed out my doorway and out of sight, not making a sound. Moments later, I heard what sounded like the door to our garage open and close, and the air lifted. All of my surroundings returned to normal. I knew I was awake. I knew what I had seen there, and it visited me, only to get worse as time went on. That image will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. Growing up in Jacksonville as a kid, I was living about a mile from a preserve and national park. Being that the area was known as a historic monument with Spanish forts and old naval bases, there were battles fought there, in which tons of Native Americans and Spanish died essentially in my backyard. Around the time of being six to eight years old, I had night terrors met with sleep paralysis events in which I would see a human-like shadow in my room. The latter only happened twice. During those two occasions, I remember seeing it emerge from the corner of my room. And during the first event, it just stayed in place. It had no remarkable features, with only the outlining of its body being a darker barrier that defined a human outline. Head, torso, legs, arms, and maybe hands. However, the second time this happened, I immediately had an elevated heart rate, and I started panicking out of fear. Most likely, I had woken from a nightmare. I was positioned on my left side, with the shadowy guy facing my peripheral on the right, and this time it started walking toward me, getting in my bed, and holding me with its hand on my chest, from that, I was in a total panic attack, to the point that I could hear my blood pumping in my ears. After a while, I guess I just fell asleep. Maybe I passed out, I honestly don't remember. Even with all of that, I don't think I told my mom at the time. Though now, I tell her about both of these experiences all the time. She kind of just says, well, maybe that did happen. Or maybe it was just a vivid nightmare. Nowadays, I look back on that with a sort of mystified perspective. Growing up, our household was really stressful for a child. There was a lot of parental fighting on a daily basis, especially with my dad being an alcoholic. He didn't abuse me, not physically, but all of that torment did lead to a divorce when I was about 13. I've never spoken with a therapist about this or anything, but I do feel like those events were likely a product of the stress. As a bonus, whenever I would talk to my dad about it later, he confirmed to me that he saw a squatting human figure up in the rafters while we lived there, well before he went through DTs. Rest in peace to the man. While on vacation in Japan last year, I stayed at an Airbnb near the Daigo Shrine in Kyoto. On my last night in town, I came back to my Airbnb at about 11.40 p.m. on a Monday night. Mind you, I had no alcohol or drugs in my system when this happened, and I was wide awake. There's a shrine that you have to walk past on a walkway that goes to and from the Airbnb to other areas of town. It was three city blocks long by two blocks going both sides. As the layout goes, there were ditches at the foot of the walls, followed by a row of plants alternating all the way down, and then there was a walkway in the middle, with a museum on the right, a whole shrine and palace at the fork. I walk into the walkway of the shrine and I ask myself this question, why are there two kids hopping a wall? As I see these two little figures hop the wall to my right, I pause and watch what's happening. 
As they both get down, they run across the path and run all the way to the end of the path by the fork and wait there. I was walking single file. They stand there for a few minutes. I walk a little closer because that was the way to the Airbnb, and I make eye contact with these things. They were about three to four feet tall, very slim but proportionate, with a bigger head and pointed ears, as white as snow. Their eyes were as big as our eye sockets, but black. Normally you can tell if someone is wearing clothes at a small distance. I was maybe 15 to 20 yards from them, but they had no sign of clothing. After making eye contact, both of them go running around the corner that I had to turn. You could also see their shadows on the walls behind them. But I slowed down to give these things space. I was freaking out a little bit at this point. As I turned the corner, they were gone. I'm walking back to my Airbnb and I sensed that I was being followed, but I couldn't hear or see anything. I have no idea what I saw. Aliens? Something else? I don't know. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted, and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. So creepy, to me, in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. 
something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down, but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend. And we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now, and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday. I'm a female 
and I was hanging out in the car last night at about 5 in the morning with my best friend who's also female. I will refer to her as Heidi. We wanted to watch the sunrise, but we live in a pretty big city, so we were trying to find a flat, high place where we could see the sky. Basically, I was just driving east until I found an empty parking lot or something that would be suitable. I guess we got distracted with the conversation because I drove probably a lot farther than I should have. Suddenly, there weren't any buildings or lights around at all, just darkness and a few trees. Up ahead, by a stop sign, there was this squarish gray shape that was lighter than the surrounding area. We both leaned forward and squinted to see what it was. Heidi asked what it was, and I said, it's where the road goes up or something like that. It was really dark, so I wasn't positive, but I was pretty sure. I think she said something else after that, but I don't really remember what it was because it was just a normal conversation. The road suddenly dipped and I drove up the slightest incline. I'm almost to the stop sign at the end, and then it hits us at the same time. Something is wrong. This feeling slams into me. The air goes still, the car goes quiet, and without even looking, I know my friend feels it too. I've never felt anything like it. Fear, I guess, but different somehow. My ears and the back of my neck were really hot like that feeling just before you pass out. Almost like when you've stood too long with your knees locked, but I was wide awake and sitting. My heart was tight in my chest, like someone had their hand wrapped around it, and I felt sick to my stomach. Not like I was going to throw up, just really uneasy. It was like primal fear. I'm not really describing this well enough, it's kind of indescribable, but that's the gist of it. It was like my body knew something that my mind didn't, which is why the only word I really have for it is primal. This all hits me in the few seconds it takes me to get to the stop sign. When I pull up to it, I see that right in front of us is a roadblock with a big yellow sign on it. Dead end. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't even feel it. Neither of us were breathing. I'm not sure if I imagined it or not, but somehow the woods around us got even darker, like unnaturally dark. I got this feeling that just kept telling me, I have to get us out of here right now. Turn around, my best friend says quietly. I don't look at her but her voice is deadly serious. My head runs through the scenario impossibly fast. The road was too tight, so if I tried to turn around the way we'd come, I'd either hit a tree or I'd have to stop, reverse, stop, put it in drive over and over again. No thanks. I turned left instead, speeding out of there, and as I drove farther away, the horrible feeling gradually lessened until it was less cold-blooded fear and more deep-seated discomfort. Did you feel that? Heidi said when we finally got to a stoplight and saw a building. We started talking to each other, just basically saying, what was that? And Heidi actually said it first, but apparently in the moment we had thought the exact same thing. I'm about to see something. I remember looking around in the dark when it happened, and I was just sure that I was going to see something. I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was just positive about it. Heidi said she looked away from the windows, but I was driving, and I didn't really get up the urge to look away for some reason. I don't know. I know nothing really happened, but this really spooked me. Heidi said something like, Maybe it was an animal hiding in the woods, or maybe there was a dead body, or maybe it was just a person who had really bad intentions. I don't know, but no logical human explanation feels sinister enough. 
I pulled up a satellite view on my phone of where we were, and there's not really much going on in that immediate area. Past the dead end signed, the woods get thicker, and the road turns into gravel and eventually leads to this nonprofit organization, some kind of little church organization. There's a few little buildings built in a circle and what seems to be some mobile homes or RVs or something, and two to three houses, all in this little clearing in the middle of the woods. There's also a little river past that. Other than that, there's just not really anything around there. Still, I haven't stopped thinking about this since it happened. I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping, and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, I woke up way later than usual. And once I did, I was really confused, because it was already dark outside. I started wondering what had happened to my mother, because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day, so I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second, I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something, but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it. And no one has ever seen me doing it. And I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody, who apparently looked like me, opened that door, but I never did. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Rando Nautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. We happened to find a random clearing in the forest, with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal, until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in, and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier having large eyes, and for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed, some kind of ritual, we don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. When Reddit user Barkella went to the theater, they got an unexpected show. Here's what they experienced. To preface this story, I've never believed in ghosts or anything paranormal. I still don't. But this is something that I fully cannot explain. This might be a slightly longer story, but I'll do my best to keep it brief. For context, I have worked at a movie theater for around eight years. In late 2017, I received a promotion. 
I became the manager, and I started to close the building at night. In short, besides office work, all that's required to close is to go through each auditorium in the theater and just check to make sure that nobody is still there. The first time anything unexplainable occurred was January 8th of 2018. I was making my rounds as usual, checking each theater to make sure everybody had left. When I got to auditorium number nine, one of the last ones I have to check, I began to walk up the walkway toward the seats when I heard voices. I didn't think much of it, but I was slightly annoyed as the last movie playing in that auditorium had ended nearly two hours prior to my check. It isn't incredibly rare for people to have long conversations after their movie has ended, but two hours is a long time. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I could tell that it was a group of two, a man and a woman. As I approached the end of the walkway and neared the corner to look up at the seats, the couple must have heard my footsteps or keys because I very clearly heard the man say, hold on. I turned the corner and began to say something about us being closed and them needing to head out. Upon looking up at the seats though, I realized that there was nobody there. I swear by all things holy, I checked behind every seat in the auditorium, behind the screen, absolutely nothing. Besides the entrance to the auditorium where I was walking up, the only other exits are two alarmed emergency doors on either side of the screen that lead outside. No alarms were set off, and I checked to make sure that both were functional. Finally, I checked if, for any reason, there was some audio playing in the auditorium. The projector had completed its closing shutdown an hour and a half before, and I was in the theater. While still having no concrete explanation, I chalked it up to me being tired, and I convinced myself that I was just hearing things. Fast forward to a year later, with nothing strange happening, and the second instance occurred. This night, instead of checking each auditorium on the ground level, I chose instead to look in through the small windows in the booth, the upstairs area containing the projectors. While the view of the auditorium below isn't perfect, the top-down view is still enough to tell if any stragglers are still hanging around. I got to auditorium number nine, and peering in, I noticed a couple holding hands in the middle two seats of the middle row. I could only barely make out the top of the two heads above the seats and their held hands resting on the cup holder, separating them. Again, I was slightly annoyed as the last movie had broken hours prior, but at that point I had drawn no parallels between this night and the previous one a year sooner. Due to there being an employee staircase directly next to my location in the booth, it took me about 45 seconds to get into the auditorium. Walking up, I heard the muffled voices of a man and a woman, and at this point there was a certain degree of deja vu. Sure enough, upon rounding the corner, or nearing it anyway, I heard the man say, hold on. Immediately realizing the similarity, I paused, took a breath, and turned the corner. Nobody was there. I freaked out, checked under every seat behind the screen, both alarm doors were completely fine and not triggered, and furthermore, I knew for a fact that the projector was shut down because I had just been up there. This time, I took it a step further in my search for an answer. I checked every exit camera in the entire theater, and there was nothing. I checked the outdoor cameras that view the exit doors of the auditorium, and again, nothing. Finally, I looked at the assigned seating chart for the last show. It was a Hindi-language Bollywood film that had sold zero tickets that day. Needless to say, nobody was in those seats. I was incredibly uncomfortable, and it only got worse when I realized the date. I kid you not, it was January 8th, 2019. I confirmed the first time was the same date by checking a text conversation that I'd had with a coworker that night, joking about how I was losing it after the first instance. Again, I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but ever since the second instance, I've never checked auditorium number nine 
on January 8th. I've thought a lot about it since though, and I still have no possible clue as to what might have occurred. None of my fellow managers have ever experienced this, but I've also been the only one working the closing shift on January 8th for the last five years. If anyone has any theories, I'd be more than interested in hearing them. I honestly don't believe that anything paranormal occurred here. I can provide any further details that are requested, but not the location for obvious reasons. And just for clarification, when I say I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, I'm more so mean in the horror sense. Stuff like horror movie hauntings, throwing chairs, leaving messages in blood, that kind of thing. The Ghost Adventures TV show, for example. The idea of a moment or event being locked in time or souls unable to fully move on for whatever reason is something that I am open to and I have considered here. I know I sound closed-minded, but I don't mean to. It's just the way that I'm trying to process things. And honestly, I still don't have a good explanation. When I was 17 or so, two friends and I decided to camp in the field next to my housing estate so we could drink beer and listen to music as loudly as we wanted. This was a huge grassy field on a slight hill where all the surrounding houses were far away enough so that we wouldn't disturb the neighbors. And we couldn't be seen by anyone unless they were extremely close to our tent. It became late and my two friends had fallen asleep. I was having trouble sleeping around this time, so I lay awake for hours, just thinking. Around 3 a.m., I heard the distinct sound of grass and vegetation as someone walked on it outside of our tent. I was stunned with terror. For one, because this was a private field owned by a farmer who would probably be angry to find us there, but more so, because I hadn't heard anyone approaching. Just suddenly, there was someone outside the tent, where there wasn't before. No approaching steps, nothing. I held my breath out of fear and shock, which is when I heard another set of footsteps belonging to a dog by the sound of it. Filled with dread, I just lay as still as possible, breathing slowly and quietly listening to this person and his dog walking back and forth outside the tent. I thought we were going to get shot or beaten by this dude. Then I saw this guy's shadow, which freaked me out a hell of a lot more than I already was. It was huge and looming over us every time he passed our tent, and I couldn't see the dog's shadow even though I heard it making increasingly erratic circulations of the tent. This carried on for around five minutes, although it felt like much more time had passed. The shadows disappeared and the sounds faded away. They didn't leave or anything. It was more like they were still walking just outside the tent, but with perpetually lighter footing. When I was sure that the sounds had ceased and that there was no threat waiting for me outside, I freaked out at my friends, still as quietly as possible, and said that we had to go because someone knew we were here and we could get in trouble with the owner. I told them everything that had happened, but they didn't believe me, thinking that I had been asleep as well and had dropped the whole thing. I assured them that I hadn't and that we had to go right away. They tried to get back to sleep, ignoring me because they're lazy as hell and didn't want to pack everything up and go. I gave up too, even though I knew that now I'd never get to sleep. 10 minutes later, the sounds returned in the same way they had gone. The volume gradually increased just outside the tent. It wasn't like anybody approached. It was just louder and louder, and then it was there. I felt the same dread that I had felt before and whispered one of my friend's names so they could wake up and hear. 
One person said, shh. They had already heard it, and they told me to open the tent to see who was terrorizing us. I did so, slowly easing my hand out of the sleeping bag and up to the zipper. It felt like it took five minutes for me just to reach it, so I was sure not to make a single sound, and I pulled it down so violently I nearly ripped the whole thing in half. There was nobody there. We got out within the space of about five seconds, and there was nobody anywhere. As I said, we were atop a hill in the middle of a field, so we could see if anyone had decided to run, but there was nothing. Even though it was impossible for anybody to escape our seeing them, I am absolutely positive that there were footsteps outside our tent that night. This is just added to by the fact that my other friends heard it the second time. To this day, we have no idea what it was. Last night, I was really bored again and decided that I wanted to see if I would have an experience at the cemetery at night. I waited until midnight and then went, and nothing happened at first. I was just walking, and then my flashlight started to flicker. I went to go hit it to see if it would start working again, and I thought I heard a whisper. I turned around and shined my light on some stone, seeing something go behind it. I started walking to it, and then behind me, I heard a stick being stepped on. I immediately opened my phone and opened an app for a spirit box. I looked at the reviews and people said that it actually worked, so I figured okay. Anyway, I was using the app and nothing was coming through when I previously tested it when I was hearing the voices. Nothing but static. So I decided to go to a really dark area where you can't even see the road. I asked if anybody was there and I thought I heard my name. I got a little bit scared, but I asked again. I said, I need to talk to you. And then I heard laughing like a madman and footsteps running around me. I ran into the light and then nothing but static again. I didn't experience anything after that until I walked to the exit and said, I'm leaving now, goodbye. And I heard a whisper right in my ear say my name. I ran all the way home and I didn't look back. And I don't think I'll go back again. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late twenties and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative four degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. He said in a shaky voice, he's here, a ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light an orange light, 
coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up and I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late, or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams, at least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the Burning Man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, all the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, the fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her 30s. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late 60s or early 70s, came out from the back and said, You two saw the Burning Man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. And if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. Not exactly sure what this was, but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there, and it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave, because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes, just messing around and trying to scare each other, when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. Like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house, and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. 
So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched. And every now and then, I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, but you try getting chased by a 1200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now, by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. I turn to my friend and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends, and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German Shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes, but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dogman, but your guess is as good as mine. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall the bigger of the two, I'll share with you now. My second visit to Old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. 
Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you are in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left, at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom, and shined the light that way. Nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again, and shined it back. Nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day, I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw, and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe 10, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder, though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boombox and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. 
He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I wanna know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was 21 years old, just finished basic training for the Air Force, and I didn't have my tech school for another six months, so the Air Force sent me home. While home in Hawaii, my parents decided to take me to Vietnam to visit, as I'm Vietnamese and my mom felt it was important for me to visit the motherland. On the trip, it was my parents, my four-year-old brother, and my best friend, Dan. For most of the trip, we did what normal tourists did. One of our destinations was the city of Kanto. It's a harbor city. Not thinking anything and never really believing in the supernatural, I was also excited to visit historical sites and stay at old hotels. We ended up staying at a hotel that was by a harbor. I don't remember the name of the hotel, but Dan and I shared a hotel room and my parents and little brother had the next room. I remember going to bed like it was any other ordinary day. I was dreaming and I saw this figure laying on the bottom edge of my bed. This person was laid in the fetal position. For some reason, my eyes were focused on his feet, then started to slowly move up his body. And then I realized he was naked. Then I saw his face and at that moment, I made eye contact with him, and he stared back at me. Once that happened, I began to have sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I could hear myself screaming, but nothing was coming out. I kept screaming, Dan, Dan, but he could not hear me. So I told myself to calm down and try to burst out. And that's what I did. It worked. I jumped up and woke Dan up. The first thing my friend asked me was why I was so pale. It looked like I'd seen a ghost, he said. I told him what happened. It freaked him out and we ran to my mom's room and woke them up. My parents asked me what happened. 
As I was explaining to them what I had experienced, the curtains covering their window began to sway back and forth, and the lights in the room started flickering like crazy. My dad, who's a total skeptic, yelled, Leave my family alone! And it just stopped. After several minutes of talking and trying to understand what happened, we went to bed. Dan and I slept in their room on the extra bed. The next day we woke up and my parents were already downstairs eating breakfast. When I went downstairs, my mom greeted me and told me she had someone for me to talk to. It was the hotel manager. She had told him what had happened and he told me, yeah, it happens a lot to people who are in the military. I was confused and asked why. He said this hotel had been built on top of what used to be an American hospital during the Vietnam War. And he said that they were trying to reach out to their comrades. I became a believer in the supernatural then, and have been ever since. I have four kids. I know that I have four kids. But recently, I just feel like there should be another one. But they're missing. When we go out, I head count and I get flustered because I can't find the extra one. I have to consciously remind myself that there are only four. But my heart just doesn't believe it. I had just put it down as one of those weird feelings and I pushed it aside. Then, my parents sent money to my kids. They sent $100 to each kiddo. They sent me $500. I called them and asked them why they had put in so much, and they were confused and said that they told me they were sending $100 per child. I reminded them that I only have four kids. They were silent for a moment and then just kind of laughed and said they must be getting old because they thought there were five. Then tonight, my daughter walked into the lounge room. She looked around and said, I know we're all here, but our family feels small. My son agreed. I hadn't said anything to anybody about my feelings lately because they already think I'm ancient and forgetful at 40. I don't really know what this means, but it's definitely strange. And apparently it's not just me. Does anyone else ever have these feelings? Was my other kid lost in a glitch? I don't know what it could be. This happened when I was 13 or 14. This was probably one of the last times that I went consistently to see my aunt. She lived very close to a mountain near Oaxaca. Her husband, my uncle, was a pretty wealthy guy. He sold and bred livestock. He had a lot of horses, cattle, goats, and dogs. Their house was a pretty big place with lots of land for the animals. Of course, their house was very isolated. The closest town was quite a ways away. We went there one year to stay with her and everything was normal for the first few days. When the weird things started happening, it was early in the morning. I wear wristwatches and I always take mine off to go to bed and put it back on after I brush my teeth and whatnot. I remember waking up, grabbing my watch and putting it on the top shelf of this shelf outside the bathroom, brushing my teeth and coming back to find it gone. I thought for a second and I looked around the shelf and under it, but I couldn't find it. I went back to the room I was staying in and looked around there and it wasn't there either. I thought maybe one of my siblings was playing with me and I looked around, but all three of my siblings were fast asleep on the floor. That's when I started getting not scared, but worried. I go to look around the shelf once more and I still can't find it. I remember saying out loud, whoever took my watch, give it back because I'm getting mad. I walk away to put my shoes on 
and from the living room I could hear a slight noise. It was my alarm on my watch going off. I peeked my head into the hallway and I could see the blue light from my watch. That's when I got scared. I walked up to it and put it on and got a really uneasy feeling. I go to watch TV and I see my aunt walking into the kitchen. I say good morning and I ask her if she grabbed my watch. She says no, but not to leave valuables in the open. I asked her why, and she says, the duendes will take them and hide them. I gave an uncomfortable laugh and said, right. She obviously saw that I thought she was crazy. She told me she was serious and that the duende probably grabbed my watch. In my mind, I'm thinking, this lady is nuts. Later on that day, I asked my mom if duendes were real. She gave me a concerned look and asked me why. I told her that my aunt said that there were duendes in the house. She steered away from the question and just said, if you feel scared, just start to pray. I didn't think about it much after that. I remember that we watched a movie in the living room and I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up to a thud coming from the kitchen and footsteps running from the kitchen. The footsteps were light, but still audible kind of like when a cat runs. I see lights turn on from the hallway and I see my aunt running toward the kitchen. I hear her say, Mendingos duendes, which means roughly damn elves. I slowly get up and peek into the kitchen and it's a huge mess. A lot of stuff knocked over, most of it food. I asked if an animal got in, maybe a raccoon. She's so irritated by the mess, she just says, Duendes. I roll my eyes and look at my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to help her clean up. We finished cleaning up in about 20 minutes, and that's when I helped her with the dustpan. It was one of the sucky ones where you have to crouch over and hold it. When I crouch over, I look to the huge pile of food, and I can see either sugar or flour. And that's when I made out little tiny footprints. Not like baby footprints, but smaller, like if a lizard had human feet. I look to my aunt and she says, I know, I saw them, I told you. I'm still not completely convinced, so I go to bed and I wake up and nothing happens for a few days. The last experience I had with these things was when I was sleeping and woke up for some reason or rather no reason at all. I remember feeling uneasy, trying to figure out why I was awake. I could hear those footsteps again as something small was running in front of the bed. I sit up fast and I see a small shadow running weird, like it was kind of waddling but still moving really fast. All this happened in a matter of seconds. I turn on the lights and nothing is there. I couldn't make the shadow out, but it was small, maybe a foot tall. That's when I started believing in them. I was so uneasy after that, and I was glad I was getting out of there. I may have been a skeptic going into it, but after that visit, I am a believer in Duendes. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, 
everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this, for all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience if my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall, shadowy figure at the end of the hall, in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her. But the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later, and my dad backs up the claim, since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment, and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different. But to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car. No dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, yoo-hoo. And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky, 
because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard, so I stepped back, and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him, and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute, and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in, and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. I'm from California, and way back when, I was on the college search. I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop, so my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old, run-down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, yoo -hoo. I kid you not, when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but
but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yuhu, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though, as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. So, I've never been the kind of person to believe in ghosts. I'm a non-religious guy. But I've seen some odd things in my 26 years. Nothing to convince me 100% that the paranormal is legit. However, I have one interesting experience that tends to get interest every time I tell it, and honestly, has made me question my stance on the paranormal ever since. About six years ago, I was a 20-year-old student living in London. My latest flat contract had run out, and I needed a place to live ASAP. I had very little money and felt guilty needing my parents to be a guarantor, so as any broke Londoner would do, I googled the cheapest place possible, somewhere I could move into that day or the next. That's how last minute this was. I was fortunate, or in actual fact, misfortunate to find a place available to move in that day. Contract signed, I had a place to live. I moved into this detached house with all my stuff the following day. It was a dirty house, but the flat occupants were all 20 to 30 year olds, four of them, and very friendly. The area was quiet, and I felt reasonably comfortable. The house was always damp and cold. It was autumn, so it's not surprising, but it was always an unpleasant atmosphere. The garden was overgrown and creepy. The windows that faced it were scratched, cracked, and looked very dirty. The hallway lights didn't work, so the entire interior of the living room and hallways connecting to the rooms were pitch black at night. The bathroom was just something else. On my first night after speaking to one of my new flatmates, I was told that they have all experienced weird noises, especially scratching on the blackened window in the bathroom. I laughed this off as utter nonsense. Probably just a tree brushing it when it gets windy outside, I thought. So after a couple of weeks, I finally started noticing weird occurrences in the building. My room's window faced the driveway and I liked to keep my curtains closed, just because it was west facing and I didn't like the sunlight pouring in and blinding me every morning. So I would close the curtains in the morning, head to class, come home, and find the curtains opened more than halfway. This wasn't a one-time occurrence. This happened every day. In fact, I could come home from class, close them again, go out to work or see friends, and come home to open curtains. Yet when I was in the room for hours on end, they never moved. Bit weird, but whatever. My windows were closed and locked, and so was the bedroom door when I wasn't there, and I was the only one with the key, I hope. Above me was an attic. Nobody lived up there. It was a locked storage room. But at night, I could hear what sounded like feet stomping. Two people walking around, kids running, and sometimes whispers. Bit freaky, but I thought maybe someone in the house had access to this room and was using it at night, for who knows what. But no one was up there. The room was locked. I would sometimes go up at night and go to the door and try to get a sense of who the hell was in there, but no luck. I never saw anything, but I could always hear these footsteps. One of my flatmates was a very religious man. I could hear him praying at least five times a day. And he was always very friendly and open to talk about his faith. 
and to listen to me stress out about the awful state of the house. But he himself didn't hear or notice anything weird, other than the unhygienic state of the place. He decided at one point to head home to Algeria for a few months, with his room locked. After six to seven weeks of living there, one of the other occupants moved out, and a room was available there. I told a friend of mine that was as desperate as I had been weeks prior, and he moved in within a few days. Things were great. We worked and went to the same uni, so it was cool hanging out with a friend. I told him the stories. Due to his religious beliefs, he wasn't a believer in ghosts. And like me, he wasn't phased by the stories. But he began to notice oddities too. The same stomping noises upstairs. The scratching windows. My curtains opening on their own. He felt like he was being watched all the time. He noticed the shed in the garden had a broken panel and could easily imagine someone being inside, sometimes watching us in the kitchen when we made food. Routine pest control opened the shed during a visit one day and found half a dozen dead rats and a pile of hollowed out bees in there. Creepy, but no monsters, right? My friend and I were eating dinner after work in the kitchen one night. I was facing him and the door to the hallway, while Steve was facing myself and the sliding glass door that gave access to the overgrown jungle garden behind. I remember him turning pale, jumping to his feet, and asking me in a very frightened tone, Can you come into my room? I laugh and asked why. He said, Seriously, can you please just come to my fucking room? It's not a joke. Then he bolted to his room like he was running away from something. I finished my sandwich with the last bite, didn't even think to turn around to see what he was so spooked about. Got to his room, and he locked the door, sat on its bed, and turned on his PlayStation. After a few minutes, he calmed down, and as he started playing, he told me that he saw something in the garden. A woman in a white dress. She walked across the garden, half a meter from the glass, almost floated past, he said, and then she vanished. He kept repeating, we have to leave, we have to leave, and that the noises were one thing, but that when you see something, everything changes. My room scarred him, and everyone else, the most. Another flatmate told us they thought they'd seen me in my room peering at them on the driveway through a 20 centimeter gap in my curtains one night. They said they saw the shape of a person's head. The only thing was, I wasn't there that night, or on any of those occasions mentioned, and I certainly don't peer at people through my window. After that, things got worse. Two nights after the kitchen incident, I'm woken up at around three or four in the morning. My friend is banging on my door in the pitch blackness of the hallway. I open it, and he comes in shaking with fear saying his bed was vibrating and moving, and that he can't stay here any longer. The next day, he speaks to a friend, has a place to stay, so he packs up most of his stuff, and he's gone. Within a few days, another person left, a little creeped out, but mostly annoyed with the poor state of the house. At this point, the remaining occupants and I are all looking for alternative living arrangements. Remember the religious guy that went back to Algeria? Well, he's been gone for months now and hasn't returned. The landlord makes a visit once a day, and he has a spare key, so he decides to inspect the room to make sure all is okay. So he opens it up and we go in. His room was amazing. It was warm, cozy, not damp or cold. It was honestly like a different house altogether. It was really nice, and I really don't know how to explain that. Finally, I had decided to move in with my partner, who had avoided this house the entire time I'd lived there, maybe visiting once or twice. She hated it, hated being there, and always felt uncomfortable. On my last night, I again heard weird noises, but this time in the hall. I was aware that I was home alone that night, as the only other flatmate left was on holiday. It was, as it always was, very dark when I opened the door. Nobody was there. I walked into the living room, and the window at the back that faced the side of the house was making weird scratching noises. 
I needed to use the bathroom, and as a necessity, I had to carry a flashlight to do the job during these hours. I walked into the bathroom, did my business, and as I'm zipping up my pants, my flashlight briefly shines over the window. For some reason, I looked, almost as if I was expecting to see something. I didn't. I walked out of the room, and I don't know why, but I decided to look at that window once more without the light. I saw the shape of a large man. I went back to my room and locked the door. All night, I heard feet stomping upstairs in the attic. I couldn't sleep, so I moved all my things into a pile in the middle of the room, sat on the bed, and waited for sunrise. I got a taxi first thing in the morning, and finally got the hell out of there. And whether I believe in anything paranormal still or not, you couldn't pay me to go back. Traveling back to Seattle through Olympic National Forest, Redditor Angry111 pulled over to photograph the forest. What they saw as they turned to leave will haunt them for the rest of their lives. This is their story. Last night, I was returning to Seattle after visiting Forks. Along the way, I passed through Olympic National Forest. It was incredibly dark, snowing a ton, and as I was about 50 miles from Forks in the direction of the Ho Rainforest, I was in the darkest part of the forest. Perhaps I should have just driven straight through, but the pines are absolutely gorgeous this time of year, and, not one to be deterred from a good nature shot, I decided to pull over. Yes, it was dark, but my phone has a night mode, and I figured this would be as good a time as any to put it to the test. I took some photos and then lowered my phone. As I did, however, I noticed something crouched on a stump. The figure was that of an extremely tall and skinny humanoid figure, with long arms that hung down in front of it, too long to be a person's. The thing was stark white and stood out drastically against the backdrop of pines and winter night. What chilled me to the bone, though, was that it had no eyes. Suffice it to say, I quickly re-entered my car and took off, content to get home in one piece and without having any unnecessary encounters with whatever that thing was. I only saw it for a moment, but if you ask me, it was a moment too long. I can't explain what I saw, and maybe it's better that way. I have quite a few stories I could tell, but I decided to start with this one, because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost, right in front of me, rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath, judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university, one of those classic guess-which-card-I'm-holding-up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs. It's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. 
The radio station was located in a faculty building about a 20 minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large rectangular room housing an office area with two glass walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side and a storage room housing the library. The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs. I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost, but not quite, touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall. I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gale and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gale and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gail, and went back into the library. Gail must have seen my eyes following it, because she said, quite excitedly, You saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here, you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night, and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. She kept her experiences to herself and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him.